Hi, I'm Katie Traxton and I am the Chief Communications Officer at Formulary. Hi, I'm Darren Adetossier and I am a presenter and content creator and I've just joined Formula E as the winner of the Open Talent Call for Presenters. What does meaningful diversity and inclusion mean to you personally? Uh, so for me, it's all about action. I feel as though diversity and inclusion in today's day and age has sometimes been made into something a lot more complex than it really is. Uh, at the end of the day, I think it just boils down to representation, feeling like you've been seen, feeling like you've been heard and considered. And so I think the best way for that to really be uh, preached and brought across to the consumer or to your audience is for them to see that that's actually happening within the company or an organization. And so, you know, employing diverse people within your workforce in managerial roles in chief executive roles um, and you know in terms of like a broadcast product seeing someone who is diverse and that looks like you those are what that's what meaningful representation and diversity and inclusion means to, to me um, and I think that it just holds so much weight when you're able to see that as a consumer because you know it's authentic and that it's not just words it's actually what the company or organization is really about. And Katie, how does that also feed into not just meaningful diversity and inclusion, but the values of an organisation? It's really important when we talk about diversity and inclusion that it's about celebrating people for who they are and understanding that it's actually our differences that make us much more interesting than what is the same about each of us. Not being judgmental, uh, taking people as we find them, giving people the benefit of the doubt. And as an organization, making sure that what you do is proactive, not reactive, thinking it's not just, oh, we should do something about diversity and inclusion. What is that? But actually, why are you doing it? And making sure that you and your staff understand that you believe in it and that that then flows through the culture and the values of that organization in a really integral way. How do we not get to that point of tokenism and quotas and it not being a sincere honest enterprise and just being we need a nation person we need someone who is black someone with a with a jewish background someone who loves someone else gender diversity etc etc how does it not become that and we do it meaningfully what what have you seen what have you experienced uh, organizationally personally to, you know, maybe something you've seen that has been excellent or something that you've seen that maybe needs a bit of work. Uh, Darren, I'll start with you on that one. Yeah, so I think that the easiest way to eradicate that is just always focusing on merit and merit alone. And I think that when I was younger, everyone was always talking about quotas and quotas. And even as an individual myself, it definitely was something that played into my mind. I was thinking, you know, is is this happening because someone's ticking a box or whatever and I think as I've grown older and I've been able to see so much so many incredible talented people it's been great because it, it shows you like hold on a second x y and z isn't in this position just because they are trying they need this person x y and z is just talented in their own right and I think the more education and the more awareness that people have that people from so many different backgrounds are incredibly skillful and talented um, is what's needed for people to sort of step back from that. Okay. This person's only there because of their background or their gender or whatever um, preference it is. So I think that it's, it just needs to, there needs to be a division between, okay, we need to have diverse people, but then also like we need to have skillful people and instead it needs to just be merged together in that you will find your skillful people amongst a diverse pool of talent. And I think that um, like the Open Talent Call for Presenters, for example, formerly e was a really great example of that. I fundamentally believe that inclusivity is essential to society, to businesses, to creativity, so many things, but also, that which makes us special is the fact that each of us is an individual. It's not about any specific group we belong to. So yes, sometimes we need to proactively outreach to underrepresented groups to ensure they're included. But the individuals there 
are individuals the same as anybody in a majority group. And for me, one of the key things is avoiding making assumptions and preconceptions generally based on stereotypes. It is unbelievable the amount of times I have walked into a room in a professional context as the leader of a team and immediately all the people I haven't met before assume the most senior looking male who's walked into the room at the same time of me as me is that team leader. Now, there's actually nothing wrong with being underestimated occasionally in life, but nonetheless, the, the assumptions are mind boggling. Equally, if we look at talent core, right, so we have we have Darren here. Now, it is brilliant that she is the first black woman to be an official presenter for an international motorsports rights holder. That's brilliant. She should be really proud. She will be a fantastic role model for young black girls, for black women around the world. But she's also a role model for young boys and for white women. And I'm already learning for her from her. And the reality is, yes, we wanted to make sure we had diverse entrance into the competition so that we had an, a welcoming culture. But when it came to the judging, it was only based on merit and it was about the best person winning. The fact that that person who was the most talented person in that lineup on the day that we were judging also happened to be a black woman means she'll be a phenomenal representative for that group. But we shouldn't conflate too many things. And I think that's what risks happening with quotas. Is there a risk that where we, where Caucasian males maybe want to make that step but don't know where to go because they don't know how to use Google? Maybe there's a question of they want to ask questions but they don't want to offend by asking those questions. What are those next steps as, as an ally and as, as a black person, as women, as fellow human beings? What's that path like for people who who don't ask those questions. So I think that Google is free and I am, um, I'm a big believer in education and like knowledge is power. And we live in a day and age where you're able to obtain so much information for free on Google. Um, so I think when educating yourself around diversity and inclusion and representation, um, to do that education yourself and really dig deep and find out whatever questions you have, whatever answers you're looking for, you'll be able to to find those hopefully. And then I think that if you would like to have more of an insight or more of a perspective, then yes, at that point, you can then potentially ask one of your friends. Um, but I think to go to your friend for all of that information, I think is quite unfair because it is quite draining as um, a person of colour to talk about issues in hand sometimes. And especially when as I say, Google is free, you can um, get it. It's like, why not use that resource rather than go straight to me? It shows, I think, if you do some self-education, it shows that you're really keen on doing it. In the same way, I always use this as an example. Like if I want to learn how to do like a eyeshadow look, I'll go onto YouTube and I can just go watch a video and learn how to do that makeup look myself um, because I'm really interested in learning it. And so it's like, if you're that interested in learning how to do eyeshadow, then I'm sure you can take that interest and in learn how to do how to um, to understand like DNI a bit better. So I'd say, if possible, and I know that you know loads of people are going to have different takes on it, but I personally take the approach that it's it's always better to try and do it yourself, so that when you do go to your friend, if you choose to, they know that you're coming to them from a real genuine place and that you have those questions that you want to ask as a follow-up rather than knowing that you're just relying on them and sort of just um, making the most of that opportunity than, than doing it yourself. So yeah, that's what I'd say. I think there's a simple point, right? And how do you ever know how to interact with other human beings? And I, I don't know the answer to that. So I always stick to like treat others as you would be treated. So number one, think about if you were in their shoes, like what would you do? And that's generally the best you can do in life. And then secondly, think about like, what's the difference between if I, if I go and ask Darren about black history, why, why am I, Darren's not an encyclopedia. Like I'm not going to go and, 
you're not going to, oh, you're Katie, you're British. I'll just ask you about the full history of like English literature. Um, that's not how it works. But if it's, um, if the Black Lives Matter protests have been taking place and Darren's my friend, why would I not check in on her? Because that might be affecting her in the same way I would check in on anything else. Presumably, there's a mutual respect such that then she can say to me, oh, actually, I, I feel like really exhausted at the moment. I don't want to talk about it. Or, oh, thank you for asking. I'm all right. Or we or we have a big conversation about it. And we go off on all kinds of tangents as any two people who get along with one another would in, in that kind of a conversation. Um, but it's just generally how you interact with people. And, and the last thing that I would say is, like, people should back themselves. If you're a lone voice, it doesn't mean you're wrong. I hesitate to quote Barry Manilow because I feel my street cred's increasingly been going downhill throughout the call. But if you listen to the song One Voice, right, sometimes you need to speak up and you need to back yourself. And it's not just that he who shouts loudest is right. And I have learned this lesson throughout my life. I have been the equivalent of runaway bride, like changing how I like my eggs, depending on who I'm having a conversation with at that moment in time. Not because I'm trying to be disingenuous, just because I want to make people happy. And then eventually you regroup with yourself and you discover, no, there's some stuff that just is how I feel and what I think is important. And that's how you end up having a conversation like today, because one of the things that I think is really important is just genuinely being kind to other human beings, whoever they are. Where could people find out more information? You're very welcome to get in touch with me via LinkedIn, Katie Traxton. I have a very unusual name, so it's easy to find me. Or you are welcome to join my incredibly small following on Twitter, at Kay Traxton. And Darren? Uh, you can subscribe to my YouTube channel, which is just my name, Darren Aditossier, um, or follow me on my social medias, also at Darren Aditossier, or follow at FIA Formula E and see a friendly face on there.